So good evening and welcome to Copperfields Books virtual event with Annie Lamott and conversation with Barbara Lane. My name is Jamie Madsen and I'm the marketing and events coordinator here at Copperfields Books and I'll also be your host for the evening. For 40 years, Copperfields Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together. Because event proceeds allow us to continue hosting this free event program, I'd like to take a moment here in the beginning to thank you all for your continued support. So just a couple of items to note before we get started. Uh, keep an eye on the chat box. I will be using it to provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, details about tonight's title and author, and we'll also include my contact details for post-event follow-up. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go-to with any questions or comments for the speakers tonight. The format will feature between 30 to 40 minutes of speaking and will be followed by a lively Q&A at the end. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see an icon that says Q&A. Please submit your questions and comments here rather than replying to my post in the chat box. Thank you. So without further ado, I'm really excited to introduce tonight's author, Annie Lamott. Annie is the author of many New York Times bestsellers, including Almost Everything, Hallelujah Away, Small Victories, Stitches, Some Assembly Required, and Traveling Mercies, as well as, as, well as several other novels. She is a progressive political activist, public speaker, and writing teacher. A past recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and an inductee to the California Hall of Fame, Annie lives in Northern California. And in conversation with Annie tonight is our own Barbara Lane. Barbara is the books columnist at the San Francisco Chronicle and the director of events here at Copperfields Books. So they are with us this evening to discuss Annie's latest title, Dusk, Night, Dawn, On Revival and Courage. And I know a lot of you have been really looking forward to tonight. So why don't you take it away for us, Barbara? Thank you, Jamie, and welcome, everybody. This is such a special night, and I'm so, so happy to have you all here. I have been an Annie Lamott fan from way, way back. I remember reading Rosie at one point and thinking, how did she know about my relationship with my mother? Because she did. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. As Jamie said, we're here to talk about Annie's new book, Dusk, Night, Dawn, and to get Things. Oh, by the way, um, I will be taking your questions before the end of the program because I know many of you will want to speak to Annie, and this is a great opportunity. So um, before we get started, uh, Annie's going to read from the very beginning of the book. So take it away, Annie. Thank you, Barbara. I don't know how many times we've we've been together in literary events over the years, but it, I always look forward to it. And it's really fun. And I love that you're so smart. I love that in a girl. Okay, <laughs> this is from the prologue. Here we are, older, scared, numb on some days, enraged on others, with even less trust than we had a year ago. The devastating pandemic and the federal government's confused and deadly response was simply the final straw to a few years of crushing developments. A UN report on climate catastrophe was published months before my wedding in 2019, the report of the extinction of one million species three weeks after. Major buzzkill. Our poor country has been torn asunder. I await the reign of frogs and I've gotten so much less young. I got Medicare three days before I got hitched, which sounds like something an old person might do, which does not describe adorably ageless me. I mostly love being in the third third of my life as it is the easiest that life has ever been, except for, well, the bodily aspects and the dither and fogginess. And I wouldn't go back a year, well, maybe back two years before the two UN reports, which have changed everything. At our wedding, where all the people we love most in the world gathered in a redwood grove to celebrate the miracle that Neil and I had found each other, needles in haystacks, and fallen in love and toughed out some conflicts. We celebrated and over ate, while outside the sacred circle, our nation and the world seemed to have reached the point of no return. So we danced. That was glorious and I hate to be a downer, but now what? Where on earth do we start to get our world and joy and hope and our faith in life itself back? Wow, 
Thank you so much. So that was Annie Lamont reading from her new book, Dusk, Night, Dawn, on Revival and Courage. And um, yeah, it's been a hell of a year. You mentioned yeah. some things. We've also had that person who used to be president and of course the pandemic and George Floyd, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, existential exhaustion and despair pretty much sums it up. So I wanna ask you um, sort of personally, how bad did it get for you? Like what were the depths that you went to over the past year? Oh boy. Um, the most terrifying period I experienced was when um, the poll showed that the election was going to be tight as a tick. And I felt like as an old lefty, I, did, I don't know. And I, I'll go to my grave not knowing whether the country could have survived a second um, term. And that was terrifying. And um, I had, you know, my best friend, um, her son was dying. All, she, he was only 23 and he died in January. And so I was there with her really, and him, I adore him. He was one of my Sunday school kids um, all the time. And she, she wrote a book about staying faithful and, um, you know, and, and semi okay. Um, called um, The Opposite of Certainty, based on a great line by the wonderful uh, old theologian Paul Tillich that said, the opposite of faith isn't doubt, it's certainty, which I like to remind our little tea party friends. And, um, and so I was hurt with her a lot, and that was kind of a different kind of um, grinding um, weight on my heart but she, I wrote about her and the book in um, Dust Night Dawn because I called her one day and I said, are you okay? And she said, I just have to keep changing the goalposts of what okay means, you know? And my son is making art with people who love him. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm okay. And, um, and that really helped me a lot. And that was something that with all the troubles and trials that came up helped me was that you change the goal, goalposts of okay. Um, you know, I was, I've been married two years and one of them was in lockdown. <laughs> and I don't remember agreeing to that when I, when I, when we exchanged vows and it's, you know, I love him. You can read about my marriage in this book, but I love so much about him. But then when you're in lockdown, you hear him chewing bacon and, and you, I just felt like I would lose my mind and have a nervous breakdown and not be able to handle it. And it would be like having a husband who had retired, you know, like a 75 year old who just wanted to be with you all the time, but who golfed, but not enough. And he's very busy. He, um, he has a book out soon and he's been, he had a million things to do and he has clients and stuff, but we were in the house together 24 seven, oh. you know? And so that was a little challenging and, um, but I did what I've always done. I mean, all my books talk about where I find solace and comfort, which is in, in my faith and in my recovery community and in nature, um, in the, the acronym for God is Great Outdoors, and in reading. You know, I'd said to Neil when I met him five years ago, I said, all I want to do when I grow up is read. That's really why I wanted to be a writer, was that because you can just get away with reading all the time. Right. And uh, I got to just do that finally. I um I tried to stay as active as I could with my causes, even though I couldn't march for them. I um, got very involved with as many food pantries as I could support, and um and I did something every day that I thought might be um contributing to the greater good. Remember when you and I were coming up, you heard the phrase "the greater good" all the time. I haven't heard it in years. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard it in the common well. What can I add to the common well? Well, a lot of days I would fill up a sack of canned foods and Oreos um, at Safeway and drive over to the canal district where a lot of people who are in the service industry work where the, um, you know, the, where COVID was skyrocketing. And I just dropped food off at the pantries and I just waved to people. And I just said to old people, I'm so glad to see you because no one else was telling them that that day. So, you know, I did what I could. I probably did a lot of the same things you did. And I walked every single day for an hour, no matter what. 
this is the blessing of living here where we live in Northern yeah. California. Because yeah. when you think about going through this last year in an apartment that you had to go up in an elevator or so many stairs in a big city, I don't know. We were very lucky. That yeah, yeah. And I want to tell all of you that this book is filled with joy. There is an acknowledgement of what we've gone through and to a degree what we're still going through because it ain't over yet. But there's so much joy in your book. And I think the major, the main question that you pose here, Annie, is how do we get our joy back? How do we get it back? And you've mentioned some things, um, nature certainly, but can you address that larger question? You know, that's funny because I, um, it was just my second anniversary and, um, and Neil and I went up to Yosemite. We haven't left the we the farthest we've gone in fourteen months is Petaluma, you know, <laughs> which is about forty five minutes away. So we kind of scammed our way into a lodge, the regular lodge, which is really sweet, like a motel, and that was very joyful. But while we were driving up there, I said to Neil, um, "I want to write a book about joy," and he said, "Well, you kind of just did." And, um, but it's joy under these circumstances, COVID and, uh, COVID and the UN reports and Trump that, um, so that it was very specific, but, um, I, it was funny. I just started to think about that, like the joy book and, um, one of my hugest source of joy is my closest friends. You know, you have four people, right? There's four people. And you can tell them anything and you can say any horrible thing, anything you thought that is just really beyond the pale and they get it. They just grok you, you know, and they laugh with you and they said, oh, I, I thought that too. I, I thought I was there last week. And so, um, but a lot of my books have to do with joy because it's such a radical act, you know, and one thing I do with, um, with if I have a group of people, which I don't in person anymore, but I always have them read that amazing poem by Wendell Berry called the Mad Farm Manifesto, the Mad Farmer's Almanac. No, the Mad Farmer's, I can look it up. And one of the lines in it is, be joyful though you have considered all the facts. <laughs> and um, it's a great poem and I'd love everyone here. It is really every single thing that is true um, that you need to remember and um, and it just brings me so much joy it brings me so much joy to print it out to for um, younger people you know to teenagers and people that I see in my recovery meetings that that online or that I see in person that I know are in recovery and I'll just voice this poem at them and I'll say this is every single thing you need to know for the rest of your life keep this with you and of course, I think I'm just mad as a hatter. But if you read it, I love that one line. I'm trying to find it so I can get it right. But um, I believe it says, be joyful though you have considered all the facts. The mad, it's called Manifesto, the Mad Farmer Liberation Front. Uh, <laughs> and then let me just read you the very end of it. Um, Go with your love to the fields. Lie easy in the shade. Rest your head in her lap. Swear allegiance to what is nighest your thoughts. As soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. Practice resurrection. Right? So this book on renewal really was about resurrection, but it's not... Christian, it's ecumenical, because the last book I wrote was on hope, almost everything, and when I was touring, which you got to do two years ago, um, three years ago, whatever it was, wherever I went to talk about hope, people didn't feel any hope at all. They just felt flattened, you know, and they felt like stunned by climate change, stunned by Greta Thunberg and the UN climate change, the, the, the number of papers. And they felt stunned by what was happening at their dining room table, you know, and some really scary, dark paths their kids or spouses were going down, some really terrifying new things that their parents were experiencing. And, uh, 
anyway, and so I sort of set out. I, I deliberately um, thought of the subhead before I thought of the title on revival and courage. Where do we start? We start where we are. We breathe. You know, we start where we are, where our butts are, and we breathe. And we tell people what's going on. We call someone. I call my friend Janine, who wrote this book, um, Opposite of Certainty. And I'll say, I hate all of life, and I hate everyone. And she'll go, oh, I'm so glad you called. Do you want to go to Target? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you. Uh, I, I, this makes me think of something at the very beginning of your book where you're just pissed off and wigging out. This is the San Diego incident. Oh, yeah, yeah. The yeah. plane is delayed. And, you know, these things can really turn a day bad quickly and you've mentioned neil your um husband of two years now several times and i'm going to ask you to read this passage because anybody out there who's ever been in a relationship with anybody is going to relate to this and i just laughed out loud um butter and you'll see what i'm talking about but if you wouldn't mind reading from the top of page 18. And I don't know if Janine is the friend you called, but you called a friend because you needed one. Uh -huh, let's see. The top of, of 18. Oh, I see this. Oh, no, it's a different friend. So I call a friend from the airport because I'm completely annoyed, basically, with all of life, but especially Neil. <laughs> and where do you want me to read to? I blurted out my grievances all the way down to butter. OK. I blurted out my grievances, all the secret ways I judge him, all the ways I judge for me, I judge me for judging him. Also that he acts very superior sometimes for such a spiritually evolved man. Also, while we were at it, that he locks the bathroom door when he does his morning toilette. I listened to his electric brush and toothbrush and shaver in the shower, wondering why would he look lock out his perfectly nice new wife. Maybe he was shooting heroin in there. And this guy thing, not specific to him, but he never wipes his glasses when they are all smudged. How can he go through, how can he see through the lenses when they're like a motorcycle windscreen after a ride through the desert? He doesn't wear sunscreen and he likes to get a tan, even though my father died of melanoma. So it is very triggering for me. Also, when we have an argument and I am explaining my position, he tilts his head in a domineering male way. And if you read between the lines, you can tell he's thinking that you can't possibly think that because it's so stupid that if you actually thought it, people would have to kill you. Also, he puts butter on absolutely everything, although it is so fattening. He cooks white rice with butter and then he serves it with butter. <laughs> That just, that just was such a moment of levity for me in this book. And again, being 24-7 with anyone during the past year, that's probably an abbreviated list. But I would also say Neil must be a very good sport. <laughs> he is. Yeah. He's a very good sport. Well, he finds it pretty, pretty funny. Good. Um, you talked about um, the teenagers you work with with at your church. And in this book, um, as in many of your other books, you write about your faith and you quote from scripture. Do you ever worry that that will turn people off who aren't religious or who don't relate to the formal church experience? Oh, yes. And yes and no. I, um, I don't tell stories that are heavy doctrine. You know, I tell stories that um, from this, you know, I go to this tiny failing church, which are all welcome to come to St. Andrew Presbyterian in Marin City, Zoom services at 11, but you know, there's 35 people there. And so a Sunday school class might be three or four people. It might be a seven year old and 11 year old and a 17 year old. One time I had three kids in my class and two of them have had brain tumors. So it's a very life on life's terms kind of class and the kids share so deeply i think it's because i give them such great snacks and juice boxes but i've really learned so much by listening to them you know i've learned how afraid they are of turning into their parents who are racing around doing these stupid endless lists of things that just don't matter and the parents are always behind and they're slightly gray from from the stress of it all and and they're the kids 
the teenagers are scared to death of turning out like that, you know, and the kids are scared to death about climate change. They're studying it from kindergarten on now, you know, Earth Day. And the kids are very fearful in a way that I think all of us can just relate to. So where do you start with that? Well, there's the one story I like the most where I just take the kids to the to a very littered beach and we clean it up a little bit, you know. And um, and so in a, at a beach, you you really are at an altar with like a it's a gigantic altar with a huge skirt of blue everywhere you look and. It re makes you realize how, how big the whole world is and how what a really precious and important part of it you are and how can you make things a little bit better. Pick up the pick up the plastic and take it home and recycle it. Take it home. We take it back to the church. We put it under the cross. We, we decorate it or we recycle. We do whatever is on our heart to do that day and, and we get less afraid. So, yeah. I think, I mean, I never tell heavy story. I never tell my kids heavy stories. I tell them they are loved and safe and that if they get to tell us whatever is going on and we, we, we welcome their trust and, and no matter what is going on in the world or in school or in their families, they can tell us and it won't go anywhere and we're safe and that we love them as is so much. And, uh, and that they have incredible, if they read, they have incredible lives ahead of them. I always kind of make a pitch for, and I make a pitch for independent bookstores. But um, so I, 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 I don't come across, I don't do doctrine. I don't try to get them to understand the triune nature of the divinity or who shot the Holy Ghost. I just ask them how the week has been going and, and how things are at home. And, and, uh, and I talk about the, the gift of service a lot. We do a lot of service. We did a lot of service to the homeless for a while of uh, bottles and a bottle of water and a granola bar. We had a, a mission, a mission of uh, granola bar ministry, we called it. And, and, and just to look at old people and to flirt with old people, to be assigned to flirt with old people at Whole Foods and to say, I'm glad to see you because no one's telling them that. So, you know, and to be patient with old people of whom I'm becoming one, I always make them laugh because I'll say, I think I'm 47. Like my grandson, Jack, said, I said to him last year, I said, oh, I thought you were like four. He had just turned 11. He said, I live here. How can you think I'm four? And I said, I think I'm 47. But so I'm in line at, at Good Earth and I've gotten my 10,000 steps in. And then there's really old people there in, in the express line with coupons, right? <laughs> and so I've taught my kids that the most magical spiritual thing you could do that day is to say to the person with their coupons, fishing around for exact change, uh, like some Beckett character, um, <laughs> you say, hi, I'm glad to see you. How's your day going? So I keep it very, very simple. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we go outside a lot too. I'm very big on nature, as you know, and the, um, I, I, we, we go outside and we look for evidence of the divine and we might see it in the daffodils with their yellow and orange clown frills on or, you know, we see it in every bird. I don't, I mean, the, I've always said, I think probably five times that if bird song were the only proof that there's a greater reality than the pinball machine of my head, it would be enough proof for me. So we go and we listen for birds. So um, you mentioned Jacks and those of us who've been reading you for years know that you wrote about your son, Sam, in operating instructions. And you wrote about Jacks, your grandson, in I believe it was some assembly required. Uh -huh. and to hear that Jacks is now becoming a teenager is a little bit mind blowing. I know. It just is. He does, for me, he still seems four. And you and I have bonded over the grandchildren thing, I but know. it's I a know. source of wonderful joy, isn't it? It's a source of wonderful joy, and I, I just can't believe it. It's shocking. The last book, the Hope book, really f had a lot of that concentration on how painful it is in your heart that it all goes by so quickly. And when you when you may have tons... The original title of Dust Night Dawn was um, The Third Third, because I was writing so much about the grace of getting older and the, the grace of my, myopia and of not being able to see things so clear, so precisely that you can judge them better or that you can remember everything bad that's ever happened to you that should still be um, avenged. And um, 
So, um, but it, I, I wrote in the last book, just said it really is painful that that my, I know you have a really little one, but mine's going to be 12. He's huge. He wears a men's nine and a half shoes. I mean, they're like, you know, a gorilla. And, um, and I, but I just, I know, I know him as a, as an infant. I know him as a two-year-old. I know him as a six-year-old. I know the thing about it all with my son and, and I know with your son and the grandkids is that they really are every age they ever were. And I can still feel Jackson in my arms just gazing at me. And I can feel that with Sam too. I can remember nursing. Oh, good. Somebody at Copperfields just posted the um, link to the Wendell Berry poem, to, to the Mad <laughs> Farmer's Liberation Front. Um, and um, so, and, and, but it's, mel you know, it's kind of, it's just all so bittersweet. I love to watch my son become such a cool young man. He has a website, a podcast called um, Hello Humans, and he's interviewed unbelie unbelievably famous people on how to be fully human, how to be how to awaken, how to begin to forgive um, yourself in the deepest, most cellular ways you can get on with it all. And uh, I'm so, so, so proud of him and Hello Humans. And um, and at the same time, he's 31. He's going to be 32 soon. And I just ache. <laughs> you know, I ache because the world's so crappy and it's so unfair and jerks win and you know, I wrote a whole piece in Dust Night Dawn about about the those our son's age, our the kids' son, our son's ages, the young men, and the world we've left them, and and how grim it is, and also why I think they should be nicer to us. First of all, we have all the money, but second of all, <laughs> we've kind of single-handedly arranged for the greatest treasure trove of scientific data in history, and we march. All of us march, and we know all the words um, to all the great protest songs. Uh -huh. Not to mention show tunes, but that's something else entirely. So we've talked about nature, and we've talked about faith. Um, the power of pets. Pets are a big deal to you, and pets yeah. help your sanity and your joy question. Yeah, yeah. Huge. I really rely on my animals. I have an old dog. That makes me very sad, but she's about 10, but she's huge. She's almost 90 pounds. Um, you can see her at uh, Neil Allen's Instagram today. There's a photo of me and my dog, Ladybird. She's like 90 pounds now. Her, she, she gained a lot during COVID, but who here didn't, right? Yeah. But you can see her if you go to, if you do Instagram, it's Neil Allen. And there's a hilarious photo of her. She's like, she, we, uh, she's like Jesus in a fur coat. I am not kidding. She's the most perfect dog. But Neil somehow captured a picture of her looking like a um, a violent attack dog. But um, I, you know, I, I she, I'm her. She's my best friend. You know, I can't wait to see her every when I leave this my office to go into the house to see her. She'll act like I was in Yugoslavia. You know, in a prison, and that I got out somehow. And then we have a cat. There's a very there's some very funny stuff about the cat in the book if I say so myself because Neil is allergic violently allergic to cats and when we first found each other on mat on match I thought I can't go out with this guy because he's so allergic to cats and cats I love 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 I'm a cat person I need to have a cat to for for my mental health and um and he said oh well I have lived with cats if you put a um if you put nutritional yeast on their kibble it after a week or so it neutralizes something in their saliva and I won't be and I thought well he's trying to get me in bed or or he's got a manuscript you know I was on match for a year and guys were bringing me manuscripts one guy brought me a plot treatment uh and and it turned out he didn't want either of those things he just we really had a amazing written rapport and then the first time I saw him which was August 27th or something of 2016. We've never been apart again, um, it, unless we've been out of town. But so he had to learn, we, we had to try the, this thing, this protocol with the kibble and it worked and the cat sleeps with us and he is madly, madly in love with the cat. So uh, I forgot all that. Well, so my the cat and I take a nap every afternoon for about 45 minutes. Because I also, you know, I loved being single too. I think that's why I got a 
good relationship. But um, it's because I love being alone. And I love quiet. Mm -hmm. And he would go to live music every single day. And I don't like to leave the house. I just like to be on the couch with the animals. And um, and so um, well, I forgot what I was going to say. But anyway, um, we had this great rapport. And they, all this stuff has come up. But you know what? Somehow, the grace of being older, the grace of kind of growing up a little, don't you experience that? Oh, yeah. You aren't as judge, okay. quite as judgmental, that you just don't care as much. I care so much less what my butt looks like. I can't even tell you. Well, you know, the third third has been really a blessing for me. I but, want to get to that, but I have to tell you that, and then I'm going to go to an audience question, but the fact that you found Neil on Match. I want to tell you how many women out there thought I've had a hundred dates that suck, but mm -hmm. she found someone on Match, and I'm going to give it another shot. I know people who did that. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, but I'm going to take this question now. Match loves you. Here we go. <laughs> um, this is from an audience person. I am facing a major life decision right now, and at the same time, having a hard time finding the joy and lightheartedness in everyday life. How do you touch the humor in life's most difficult moments? Well, that's a great question. I could write a whole book about it. Um, my sp The spiritual side of me uses these little containers. I'll find one. Uh, I call them little God boxes. They might be a little match box. I have one right here somewhere, but... Of course, I can't, I can't find it right now. And I'll just write a little note that'll have one word or a situation on it that is vexing me and that I can't keep my sticky, I cannot let go of. You know, we say in recovery that everything we've let go of has claw marks on it. And when I get to that point of having made myself crazy, I write it down, I put in a little note, and I say to God with enormous hostility, here, <laughs> it's all yours. And then I try to keep myself occupied. I try to keep the patient comfortable till I hear back. And the mail will come or the email will come or the phone will ring and there'll be some kind of solution. And um, from the secular side of me, I, um, I call my girlfriends. And, um, and as soon as I pick up that 200 pound phone and just say how troubled or joyless I feel, we always end up laughing, you know, because and I've always said, you know, laughter is carbonated holiness. And once I'm laughing with a friend, I'm halfway home. And I, um, you know, in the, the recovery, they talk about the deliberate manufacture of misery. And I would say I have a PhD in the deliberate manufacture of misery because of this brain. You know, it's like a, it really is like a pinball machine. And so I need to change channels. And so I can do really simple meditations. I can, um, I can go for a walk. I can, I can clean a drawer. You know, COVID college taught me so much that you, that you can't just sit around and, and, um, and think about how, how stupid everybody is and how this sucks and, and then feel guilty because you actually have it so much better than almost anybody else. Right, and so you clean the really bad drawer. You go, you go, uh, you 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 go for a walk with your mask on and a friend. You go visit someone. You 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 make a care package for somebody who you don't even like that much. You may have an, a relative who's always been harsh to you and never really thought that you were um, living up to your full potential. And you take them a care package. You know, you with a a book you love and and a really cute pair of socks and a chocolate bar and a note. I was just thinking of you. I wish I could see you in person, but I hope you enjoy these things. So you take the action and the insight follows. And the insight usually is that we have so little control over almost anything, certainly people, places, and things. And that all we can do is try to change channels from this terrible station in our mind of judgment and blame, which are my strong suits. Usually my default place is to try to figure out whose fault it is that I'm uncomfortable and how to correct, get them to correct their behavior so that I'll find everything less annoying. And I can change channels though. I'm, I'm powerless over people, places and things, but I'm not helpless. And usually the way I let go of any of it 
is to say it out loud to someone. I can say it to Neil or to my friend Janine or to Sam. And as soon as I say it, the trance is broken. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned before, we're not as judgmental as we age. And part of that is not holding on to things as much anymore. And that brings me to a question about the power of forgiveness, because that's at the heart of, lot, of a lot of this work, it seems. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I always write a lot about forgiveness, no matter what the ostensible theme is, it always to me comes back to forgiveness and that this place, this life being um, forgiveness school and that that's what we're here for and, and it's really hard <laughs> some days and I hate it sometimes and I think that there are people I will never forgive and maybe sometimes my heart gets a little tiny bit softer and I think, okay, that's good, I'll take it right but but um we're the person harmed by not forgiving and you know i was actually talking to the great carolyn mace the writer why people don't heal and how they can uh, a couple months ago on a podcast and i was telling her about these people who really trashed me uh when sam was really little three three and four two years in a row and we went to summer with them for a week or two on cape cod they had tons of money and I didn't have a, a red cent. And it just kept coming up how fun, how much fun they were having with all their money. And, um, and then they really trashed me and there was a small crowd around. And so I, um, I had behaved badly and I made amends to them and they had written me a snotty letter in return. And so I told Carolyn and this family had kind of re-entered in this roundabout way in my life. And I told her about it and how I could keep feeling triggered by the memories of how they had behaved in my, the hardness of my heart. And she said, you need to, to retrieve your soul from that memory. And I blew my mind. And I said, don't say anything else. I, I'm going to write it down. And I wrote down, I need to retrieve my soul from that memory. And I think Tikkun is about the mosaic chips that we've left in unforgiven and harsh situations among other places and that we can retrieve them and that we are not drained and sapped and made toxic by our lack of forgiveness mm -hmm. so i actually wrote down what carolyn said on the wall and i thought you know i can say to my soul you know what i've got cheetos and the new people magazine so you can make a choice whether you want to hang out with me or with those miserable people on Cape Cod. I can wait. <laughs> so, you know, my soul would always come back like a little child, you know, it would come back and, and we'd be together and I'd feel like I don't have so many Swiss cheese holes in me. Most of my spiritual work has, and in most of my writing, I would say almost all the book, every book I've written has been about forgiveness somehow because I, I, I do think it's um, why we're here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have written a lot. In fact, you and I have talked recently about getting old, particularly physically getting old. Um, you know, there are some blessings about getting old. There's some wisdom and there's some stupid stuff we don't have to do anymore. But um, physically, for those of us who are boomers, it can be kind of shocking because as you said, we think we're 47, then we look in the mirror and think, what is my mother doing here? It's just really horrifying. So so talk a little bit about your body, you know, being a woman in this country, there's a certain built-in disconnect with our bodies, a certain, for many of us, um, judgment, hatred, whatever you will say about our bodies. Talk about that. Talk about your body, your body aging and how you're doing with that. Well, I came up in the 50s, as did you, and in the 50s, there were just so many weird, harsh trips around food and the starving children in India, and also the fact that you weren't allowed to actually have feelings like um, anger or sorrow or anything. If you had them at the dinner table, you got sent to your room without eating, right? Did you? Yes. Yeah, we got sent to our room without eating. My older brother might sneak me an orange, and that would be all I had till breakfast and so coincidentally I developed a tiny uh, lifelong eating disorder and first I was very 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 thin and for some reason when I was coming up 50s and 60s it was okay for grown-ups to comment to your parents that you were so skinny 
you know, and, um, and so I got a little bit of a, um, I forgot what we call it, a condition, you know, I got super self, toxically self-conscious that I was so skinny and, and it was all big breasts and big blonde hair and I had this crazy frizzy hair and, and little and little. Then at about 14, I gained a bunch of weight and then I was too heavy and then for the rest of my life, I was either dieting or I've been anorexic a couple times. I've been 20 pounds less than I am now. I mean, way more than 20. I'm about 140 now. I'm 5'6", and I've been down to 110. And when I'm 110, I just think I look so great. And um, and then, then all of a sudden, uh, at about in my 40s, this thing happened where I remember on uh, the Golden Girls, um, who was Ma, Ma, who was, what was her name? The main, the main girl. Me, Arthur. Arthur. She said, these aren't my hands. These are my mother's hands. And I grew up playing tennis all those years in the hot California sun. And the, my arm, you won't be able to see, I would show you, but my forearms, they're like Jessica Tandy. I mean, they are so loose and they just hang in strips. And in the book, in Death's Night Dawn, I write about um, trying to get Neil to recoil from, in the upper arms, forget about it. And <laughs> I try to get Neil to recoil and I'll go, look at this, but he won't look close enough. And so I'll get them even closer. And he said this thing, I thought it was infuriating. He said, some of us got more sun than others. <laughs> and I thought, what is that weird aggressive shit? But you know, he sees my arms as the arms of, of the woman he loves who holds him in a way that no one ever held him before. And then I see, you know, if, if anyone's talking about cosmetic surgery that might do the arms, you know, that if they could, I, I would do it. I think I would do it. They and, probably do. What? They probably do that, don't you think? No, I looked it up. <laughs> 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 you can get rid of the situation the droopy hang, but then you have a have to have a long scar, a thin long scar running from your armpit to your elbow. Oh. So, um, I mean, I've thought about it. I think if like Neil goes to visit his family or something, and he has two brothers on the East Coast, and we go to the beach with them every summer, and there I am in my swimsuit with my horrible cellulite condition and the arms, and um, and I, but you know what I do? I also at some point. In the third third, I realize I don't know how long I'm going to live. But if I see ocean water and I don't get in it, it starts to argue a wasted life. Yes. If I don't get in it because his brothers might think that I forgot to go to the gym after I had my baby 31 years ago, then they get to think that. They get to see through their eyes, whatever they... And so it was has always been about this radical self-love for me where I put on... I put lotion and sometimes a little temporary tattoo on my thighs and I, but, um, I have thought about doing my arms. It's, it's just kind of shocking. And the only thing that really works is the self love, you know, and longer sleeves. I wear a lot of three quarter length sleeves. People will give me these really adorable t-shirts that have great either slogans or sayings or Elizabeth Warren or tie dye or something. And, but they're up to here. And I just make a profuse expression of my gratitude. I'm not going to wear them. Are you kidding? <laughs> so anyway, I know that doesn't really jive with my my trying to be a seeker and trying to live from my soul and heart, which I write about so much. And this whole book is about from spirit and soul and heart. But I'm a I have you know I have dual citizenship. Here I have a biography, I have a body, I have genetics, I have my mother's arms and thighs, and I'm also, I believe, because I'm a believer, that I'm a child of God. And so trying to balance those two identities sometimes is a little dicey, let's say. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here's a great question from Curtis. I love this. Before shelter in place, did you sometimes say or think, it's too people-y outside? It's so people outside. Oh my God, I love that question. And it's too lifey. It's just way too lifey and too people y. And, um, um, you know, a lot of us, I won't name names, but me and Neil kind of don't care if the quarantine ever ends because 
Um, although I wanted to so that less people get sick and I don't want anyone to unnecessarily um, suffer as a result of it, but I'm happy home. I'm happy here. I'm happy reading. I'm happy taking a nap with a kitty, you know, and um, I'm an introvert anyway. I mean, I can be very, I can ham it up on stage, but like I think you are, I just, I love the internal life, the interior life. I love ph philosophical stuff. I love reading. I love literature. I I'm in I'm enlivened, and I it, it something in me blooms in when I'm in my interior realms, and I go outside, and I you know I, I'm kind of always anxious, and and uh, and I I never ever eat with people I don't know. I have we have no social life. Neil would eat with people five days a week, and the other two nights he'd go to live concerts. So uh, I only eat with like four people and, and my son and grandson are here a lot, but that's it. So um, it's very peopley. I love that word. I'm going to write it down. In fact, I'm going to steal it. So just so think, you know, I think Curtis might be okay with that. So um, uh, you talked about literature and what you love and it all sounded kind of very highbrow, but I suspect you might just have binge some junky TV on Netflix during the pandemic, did you? And what was it? Well, why don't you tell me first what you binged on? Well, you know, I binged on something. Well, I guess Call My Agent, I definitely binged, uh -huh. which is a French show. And it's not quite that junky. And I also binged something called The Bureau, which is like a, another- oh, that's a great show. I think that's actually a terrific show. I do too. So it yeah. wasn't like the Pringles of network television, but yeah. I'm kind of wanting you to say like, the, the what I want you to say is the equivalent of a Real Housewives or something just- No, no even worse. No, even worse. First, oh, this is just, don't tell anyone. No. Of course not. First, I watched every episode of Selling Sunset, which is these mostly really vile real estate agents in Southern California at this one real, real estate office there. It's two seasons. It's excellent. And I felt when it was coming to an end that I couldn't go on. And, and, and Jesus and recovery and my political act, nothing could help me. And then I discovered Below Deck. And I have watched every season, not only of Below Deck, but of Below Deck Mediterranean. What I is it? What? What is it? Well, I just want to add, um, I'm about to embark on Below Deck Sailing. Um, so it's a show. It, it makes the Real Housewives look like Masterpiece Theater. <laughs> it's about these fantastically wealthy people who charter these yachts that are like 180 feet long, like Aristotle and Nassus type yachts, you know, they can sleep 10. And then it's about, it's sort of upstairs, downstairs. It's about the stews and the, um, the crew up above. And of course they're, they're mostly beautiful. And, um, and some there's a chef and it's just, I mean, it is so on beyond zebra, but I think it's what really got me through. And I'd like to see some comments from people that they have, um, they won't admit it, but um, that they I want to believe. wait. I can't wait. So um, from the ridiculous to the sublime, because, um, and then I want to talk about books, but um, who are your heroes these days? Like, who are the people who you just think hung the moon now that we're coming out of such a difficult period? I still love Elizabeth Warren. I still love Hillary. You know, I, I love a lot of people who have gone on. I, I still love the Berrigan brothers. You know, I was raised on the Berrigan brothers. And um, I um, I always loved Mary Oliver because somebody would foist a Mary Oliver poem on me and I wouldn't have read it. And it would be so perfect, mm -hmm. so forgiving and such an awakening, such a blink awake awakening poem. And then you get to voice that on everybody you love. Then they all love you more because you've given them this incredible poem. So Mary Oliver does that for me. I, I love Barbara Kingsolver. She's a literary hero of mine. I mean, I know if I have a Barbara Kingsolver book, I mean, of course, Poisonwood Bible, but um, also Shelter's brilliant, but also the book, I forgot what it was called with Frida Kahlo, 
and um, Diego Rivera in Mexico City with poor um, Trotsky tr <laughs> racing around trying to not get assassinated. That is maybe maybe our caseworker at uh, Copperfields can look it up. It's Barbara King saw it's about 10 years ago. Oh, it was wonderful. It was so cinematic and colorful and alive and bright and brilliant and political. So um, I love Joe Biden. I'm good with Joe Biden. He is just fine with me. And um, so um, I wanna, uh, there's somebody here I just want to read from what they say. I'm a healthcare worker and so burnt out by COVID and the in-person care I've needed to con continue to provide. I feel like I want that same break to binge on Netflix or, or read. Everyone else is coming out and I'd like some time to go in for a while. You know, Valerie, that is so profound, the way that you've said that, because it really says it all, that to live the way I'm living is the ultimate luxury. And all I can say is that for the first 50 years of my life, I didn't have this. You know, I had, I just had massive stress, a massive um, financial and um, critical and um, professional stress. And then I had a kid who got into mess and alcohol and you know I spent like five or six years going down that very very dark path he's got nine and a half years clean and sober but this phase that I'm in is a luxury and, and a great blessing and and my prayer for you is that you get to experience this too unfortunately you know there's no magic wand and COVID isn't going to end in the next couple of months and um but i've been where you are of that absolute existential exhaustion and stress and and stuckness and all i can say is this too will pass mm -hmm. and that there are ways to make space some make life a little bit more spacious whatever's going on in your life and it might mean going without something else but if it's the priority um, that you have some peace of mind and a little bit of breathing room, I think that can be brought into existence. And I'm just sorry, I've, I've been there and I know you've been there, Barbara, and it's a drag. And one of the great things about being old is that you're kind of retired. I don't have to do anything. You know, I don't actually have to do anything. And I do a lot, but I don't have to. Several oh, the lacuna that um, Jamie yeah, just, yeah. Say. The Several Barbara King are, Solver book about uh, Mexico City is called The yeah, Lacuna. Brilliant. So um, I just want to, there have been several questions about getting a signed copy of Anne's book. And Annie did sign some books for us. And she lives very close to one of our bookstores and is happy to go in and sign more. So if you want to get a signed copy of her book, um, you can do that through Copperfields. I also want to say, and here, here it comes, the pitch, Copperfields does put on these programs free, and we spend time thinking about what to bring you and staff time. And just please, 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 please don't watch this wonderful program and buy a book on Amazon. I'm asking you that from the bottom of my heart. And I know, Annie, you have a lot of love for independent bookstores. So do you want to add anything to that? I just want to add that I, I really think that if you buy your books at independent bookstores where possible, that you will get a better seat in heaven. <laughs> I do. I think you will be near nearer the dessert table, which is where I will be. <laughs> that's the best and I think um, to close and I have more questions and I know everybody else does but you have this wonderful poem and by the way Mary Oliver writes great dog poems too yes but you have this wonderful poem at the beginning of your book by Ursula Le Guin would you mind reading that oh. I just love that poem and I'm so happy you opened the book with it and thank you, Barbara, before they come for us with hooks. I l have loved every interview we've ever done. Oh. I tell people about the interview um, we did at the JCC, where I taught, where I read my piece on whether Jews camp or not from trampoline <laughs> Nazis. And, um, I, and I, I've loved every one of them. And, and I'm at your service. If you need oh. me to show up for one of your causes, I'm your go-to girl. I got a lot of them. <laughs> okay, so thank you. And here is the Ursula um, Le Guin poem. It's called Hymn to Time. Time says, let there be. 
every moment, and instantly there is space and the radiance of each bright galaxy, and eyes beholding radiance, and the gnats flickering dance, and the sea's expanse, and death and chance. Time makes room for going and coming home, and in time's womb begins all ending. Time is being, and being time, it is all one thing, the shining, the seeing, the dark abounding. Amen. I love it. Annie Lamott, the new book is Dusk, Night, Dawn on Revival and Courage. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for all you do. You are so wonderful. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Get a signed copy from Copperfields and be well. Thank Good night. you. Thank